Thank you so much for coming to the season finale concert of the New Jersey Festival Orchestra, especially to the pre-concert lecture. You guys are in for a treat, I hope. There'll be uh, quite a lot to say, and Mahler is one of my favorite composers, someone who I do want to do a life study on and write a dissertation on, so he's my guy. I'm a very, very big fan. Um, I'm a music historian. My name is Michael Rosen. I'm the music historian and scholar for the New Jersey Festival Orchestra. I write for WQXR, New York's classical music radio station, 105.9 online blog. I'm a contributing writer and a content developer. I'm also the music director of the First Baptist Church right across from Trader Joe's down the street. I'm the organist and choir master there. I was born and raised in Westfield, so it's many memories of growing up. My first concerts coming here when this orchestra, which is formerly the Westfield Symphony Orchestra. Program tonight, as you can see, the title is The Battle of the Titans and Two Titans. Definitely Tchaikovsky and Mahler. Oh, I remember I have to put these guys up. These, these are on this, um, these are on my window in my on my mirror in my bedroom. So I'm so sorry about all our in check up scene. Yeah, great. Watch over me. Um, they are two two truly titans in different ways, definitely different approaches, but both in a way, both titans in a certain sense, also plan words because the Titan Symphony, but I'll get to that when we talk about the first symphony. The first work is a piece by Scarmelline, Anthony Louis Scarmelline, and he was an Italian-American composer who immigrated here in the early 1900s. He was a young boy. Um, he was born in Schio and came to Brooklyn. He was really an Italian-American, and he started dabbling in composition and music at a young age. He was very interested in playing piano and composing, so his parents enrolled him in the German Conservatory of Music. That's no longer, that was in New York City. It's no longer around. That became became part of the New York College of Music in 1920, and then that became part of the NYU uh, Steinhardt School of New York University, which is a Steinhardt School of the Arts for classical musicians. So you could say he went to NYU, NYU technically, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but there's some back then there were many conservatories and schools for German conservatory, Irish cultures. Um, he really initially trained to become a concert pianist, but because uh, of a hand injury, he stopped that pursuit. Um, I think it was carpal tunnel. He complained of um, motor. Um, irritation, limited motor movement, which sounds like carpal tunnel, but he still played very formidable pianos for the rest of his life, but he decided to focus as a career as a composer, and he was quite a prolific composer. He wrote a lot of works, many different genres, three operas, including a bunch of symphonies. This work is an overture, the title is The Overture on a Street Vendor's Ditty, and a ditty is like a slang term for what we say, tune, melody, a jingle, um, and the tune is, and so it's when it's actually autobiographical. When he was growing up in Italy, he remembers walking along the boardwalk, the equivalent of what we have at the boardwalk at Point Pleasant, and all the vendors selling items. And he remembers the ice cream that the ice cream man is tuned that he would sing when he sell ice cream. Um, and it went something like. Leading to the classical era. Um, so 
Bach's son, C.B. Bach, J.C. Bach, and early Haydn in a Rococo style. It's not, it's not Baroque, but not yet classical. So it's a turn away from the highly contrapuntal sound of the Baroque era, which a lot of counterpoint, but a refreshing trying to have a new, it's still, but still having been in the classical frame of that refreshment, but still being contrapuntal. Rococo was as much in art and dance form. Um, it's equivalent of a galant style, and that's galant, it means the same thing, having more than little trills, hopefully a little something. So. That's Mozart, that's Mozart piano sonata, um, K33, K333. And those passing tones, leading passing tones, jumping in, jumping out, um, that is the style and that Mozart was a master of. Um, and Tchaikovsky was able to grab this piece, is, it's a variation on a Rococo theme. Most composers would have just used a, written, a theme written from that time, like the Brahms, variations on a theme by Haydn. They used pieces of uh, theme by Haydn. It's very common practice to take an old. But he was such a great tune man, tunes craftsman, um, Tchaikovsky. He's known today as just an amazing master of the melody. That he wrote his own, like we know, you all played a bit of Tchaikovsky melodies that we know and love today. I mean, we know <coughs> that's the thing with the composers, they're good, they're good at writing melodies. But Tchaikovsky is at like a whole nother level. He's beyond any other composer. He was able to write and uh, mimic different genres, like from, um, well, the most famous, Romeo and Juliet. Tchaikovsky's gift of melody comes through, and it's just his power, and it's incredible. 
ability to capture that Galan style and the sound. It's very virtuosic, you know, for all intents and purposes. It is a concerto for all intents and purposes. It is, um, like, it's very, it's a bunch of things. It's a really virtuosic work for the cello. Um, and it's a standard now for cellos, so it's a great piece. Um, and it, it doesn't, and ever since then, he, there's stories of, of Tchaikovsky saying that he, Fitzenhagen said that Tchaikovsky approved these changes, but then there's a story that at the premiere, Tchaikovsky said, oh, I didn't know he changed all this music. So it's one of those, <laughs> yeah, go on from that. But great, let's go on to the last of the Mahler, the symphony number one, in D. Subtitled Titan, um, great piece, first piece. Titan is already a problematic title, we'll find out about that. This is a, um, the first symphonic, the first symphony by Mahler, which had many permutations going on to it. Um, Mahler is said to sing a lot of books. Mahler is, was a famous German composer, a Viennese um, Austrian composer, and eminent opera conductor, one of the best opera conductors of his time, and probably of all time, to be honest. Um, this statement that he said, this is one of his most famous quotes, the symphony must be like the world, it must contain everything, is something that I, I really want to want you to keep in mind, and that's the theme of this, and kind of the theme of his whole area of dualisms and these power of dualisms. Um, he, he, unlike other symphonists, the way he approached this genre has to be thought a different way, and I wrote this in my program notes, and if you, when you look at them, you read that beginning section, because he, He's remembered today as one of the greatest composers now to ever live, and he has relatively a handful of, of works to his name compared to, like Tchaikovsky, a great example of, you know, this man, ballets, operas, symphonies, concerti, he was a master of all of that, you know, and, but Mahler is considered among these ranks, and Mahler has these relatively small works, and they're all symphonies, every one of them pretty much is a symphony, or at least a symphony for boys, it's a two-part symphony. They're not, he didn't have a ballet, he doesn't have an opera, he doesn't have, and it's not that there's many musicologists or music historians that argue that they could or couldn't write it or they were, you know, felt intimidated or they chose not to. And I'm gonna go with Mahler choosing not to. I'm biased, I'm gonna say, like I said, Mahler's, my, I'm gonna get, it's, this gets a little heated, I love Mahler more than anything, so it's this, I have a very personal connection, so. But as a historian, I'm gonna bring out all the information, I'm bring out everything in display. I won't bring any biased info in here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy it, I'm buy it. Um, I'm gonna tell you where it comes from and why that might be and what this statement means and what, where he's coming from and how to approach that symphony. He was born in Bohemia, which is a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at that time, now it's modern day Czech Republic, uh, to an abusive father uh, who was an, father was an alcoholic, a very neglectful, and a mother who didn't really pay attention and was kind of an invalid. Um, he was Jewish, and right there, that is um, even as much as, and he converted later on in his life when he had, took, he had taken a, a position as a court opera conductor and converted to, to Catholicism because a Jew couldn't work there. And um, and there's there's his, his history of him being Jewish and what he actually believed and why he converted if it was for just for professional reasons and for more information, more facts, both, I mean, information points to that he did convict, uh, convert because of of professional reasons and that and he did explore many elements of culture and religion in his symphonies and that it wasn't it wasn't so real that his music isn't as sacred as obviously the way Bach, you know, or someone was a Christian in that way. Or the or Mendelssohn came from a line of as Jewish as background, but it was very much Christian. Um, he mentioned Mahler always talked about how he felt alone, how he, he said once I was thrice exiled, I feel like an alien among Jews, an alien among Germans and now an alien among Viennese and or conductors, you know that this that's what I was mentioning that dualism they split and that's you know that's I don't take credit for that the late great Leonard Bernstein amazing conductor composer air lecturer extraordinary everything famously made the Young People concert lectures and he did an amazing lecture towards the end of his life on Mahler's Ninth Symphony and he opens with it talking about these dualisms and he says but it's so important to consider the Mahler cosmopolitan peasant Christian Jew the sole ego romantic artist, father figure, and husband, trying to balance all of that. And cosmopolitan because New York Philharmonic, Vienna Philharmonic, Metropolitan Opera, conductors of all of those operas, in, involved in some of the highest positions in, in city centers, in classical music, in the history world to this day, yet always retreated to Meyernick, write his pieces off a small short house, came from very humble beginnings, and associated with that 
peasant culture as much as the city culture, and how that makes its way into the symphony, and why that, that's this means, why this statement makes sense, knowing that those two, those two poles, he's a, the cultural tug of war, he's the war, he's the rope mauler, I would definitely put him there. I don't, before it starts on, he, so musically, he's young, 15, he gets, takes calluses from a young age, he goes into the conservatory when he's about 16, 15, 16 years old, and works, comes across a lot of, um, Hugo Wolf is there, um, um, Bruckner was lecturing at that time, but he's part of a small group, and it's kind of like a group that's against the, under the academic, uh, it's not in the curriculum, it's like a dead poet society, it's not, it was not even like a frat, it was a small group of students that were all interested in this movement of German modernism and admired Wagner, which wasn't yet in the curricula, and that's why they didn't, it was kind of behind the scenes, they were still focusing on, you know, the early 19, first half of the 19th century, they weren't ready for what Wagner was doing, and Wagner, whom all are later, became a huge fan of and a big interpreter of his operas. He admired Wagner for his work in that, that what's known as um, three tonal, highly chromatic, which became German modernism. But what's different with Wagner and all the other members of even the new school, that's the new Wagner list, and that Wagner did everything from the music to writing the text to preparing the sets and building. I mean, he would have he would have stitched the costumes himself. He could have Mahler was the most hands-on control freak. He just he built he, he built his world. He they even called them operas. He called them music dramas. Mahler just cared about the music. Mahler was infatuated with what he could do with that music, this progressive tonality, which means it's music that grows and it's to create these long phrases that can make space. That's music that's not just moral, but it feels like it's three dimensional and four dimensional. And that's what Matt attaches itself to this, because when that kind of infatuation mixes with someone who's such a symphonic traditionalist, that's what, birth, that's what gave birth to Mahler. Someone, that's what makes him so unique, because he did have a lot of typical approach to the synth. He did mimic a lot of things that Bruckner. And, um, and Brahms did, and Beethoven um, <coughs> honing in these ideas, but it's how he put together, it's that confluence of these ideas. Right from the opening, I'm going to play the beginning of the, opening of the first movement of the symphony. It begins, a classic, and this is another, it's not a typical, it's an open A, and it's got this falling, falling pattern, which again, is not a new idea, it doesn't begin with the melody the way Versa world, Beethoven's ninth begins like that. All the broken symphony starts slow and small. So, but what makes this different is how long this part takes on, and how much a tense he builds, and how important it is to build that space. So it's just strings, and then upper wind, and then. Physics, these sound engines, these 
sound patterns are in the beginning of this symphony. That's how well, that's German modernism. That's that's Mahler, the forward thinker. That's not Mahler, you know, that's Mahler admiring what Wagner would do. But in this symphony, he didn't need an opera to do it. He puts that right from the start. But it's still in a modified sonata allegro form. It goes on, we have a, a B theme, a second section, a development section that brings a turmoil and you know strife and it ends in D major, a brighter key from D minor and D major. The B theme comes from the, uh, the, the work before this. He was a young, he was he wrote this. That's another because this piece changed so many times, but he started working it in the late 20s, 27, he was 28, so like 18, 80, 18, 87, 18, 88. <coughs> Um, but before that, the first real big work before that was Songs of the Wayfair, and it's a song cycle that he wrote the own text for, and he wrote for a baritone. <clears throat> and the text describes beauties, the sound of a, a man admiring nature, but also admiring his love and talking about his love and heartache, how he's he was upset about his relationship didn't work out, you know, the standard kind of. But and at the time, to, it is projection because you could say that Mahler did have a very bad relationship with two failed relationships, with two singers, Johanna Richter. And the second one was um, Mariana von Weber, which was the granddaughter of the, of the grandson of the composer of Der Freischutz, Maria Carl Maria von Weber. Apparently, that one was there's not a lot of details, you know, just like even today we you know, don't talk about the details with, with the normal relationship for today. But he, um, that one was apparently started a lot. I don't know why. He spoke and said that was a tumultuous one. And this kind of song cycle came out of that Songs of Wayfair, this song cycle that was before his first symphony. So, um, he, that tune makes its way into the symphony, and it comes out right after this whole movement. Because even, even in the Beethoven 9, as you mentioned, it, because this is reminiscent of Beethoven 9, and Beethoven 9 started, Beethoven 9 symphony started this trend, this post dramatic, it kind of divided anything after the 19th century, then it confronted what Beethoven did in the 9th. It's a work of limits. Schoenberg set a work of limits, meaning that he created new limits. So that's why Schubert, Schumann, Brahms, there was so much intimidation to approach this new form that Beethoven created. But, so there's a lot of references, you know, that were standard at that time, but after Beethoven's nine, Beethoven nine all of these the same as the fifth, and falling, fourths, and fifths. But there is an A theme, and then the B theme in B flat major. But Mahler doesn't have an, an A theme. After this whole opening with the falling forces, it goes into the This opening material is an A theme, so not only was there no mute, not a lot of musical material, he's giving it, he's giving it weight. I mean, that's going to come back. That has that theme that carries weight. So this idea of space and landscape is a musical idea. It's theme one, and so he can use that later, form that complements itself. Not only this quote, but this is another great quote from Mahler: "Composing a symphony means to me building a new world with every available technical means. The ever new and changing content determines its own form." The last line exactly states what I was just saying. That the new and ever changing content determines its own form. That he can use that opening as a content to develop. That the B theme, that's from Gingoy's Morgan Hoover that's it's the second movement of the Songs of the Wayfair. And it's about a man singing how much he loves nature and enjoys love. And most of the Wayfair songs are about that. Um, and he was very quiet about Mahler. And I, I, the, those songs come, the symphony comes from those songs, and at first this piece existed as a tone poem with titles, programmatic titles at the beginning of all of the movements. I'll get to that later. But the final form, which took about 10 years, is just a symphony four movements with no titles. So, but before that, he, when he did admit that it was, you know, based on this story and it comes from a failed love story that he had, that's why the songs were way better in it, because that is about a man loving nature and finding his roots. But, being talking about love scorn, and Mahler did say a quote about it. Mahler said, I should like to stress that the symphony goes far beyond the love story on which it is based, or rather, which preceded it in the life of its creator. So I'll say that again. I should like to stress that this symphony goes far beyond the love story on which it is based. So that this is based on a love story that he had, or a failed love story that he had. He said, or rather, which, it, which preceded it in the life of its creator. So it's, it is about that, but also it's about more than that, and also even more before that, before I was born, is what he's saying, which is kind of e easy to see from the beginning. It's just the creation of time, this, that ability to create the foundations of nature and sound. So that's why nature works its way in there. The second movement is the land alert, which is a typical German three-step dance, like a waltz. Again, it's something that 
is a very, it's, a, it's in the right to Marx language, it's a very German, very style, um, German dance, old German dance, that is 5-1, five, 5-1, one, five, one. the tune looks like, if you look at the tune, it could be a Mozart melody, but it's the way he orchestrates it, he puts accents on every note, and it's a very, you'll see, it looks like a dance with the strings, how much they have to, all everything's down, goes boom, 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 da, 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 da. always exaggerated, that's, and that's classic Mahler, so even early on we see Mahler, that's a classic Mahler, he over-exaggerates everything, and he makes it, he, and it's intentional, it's this satirical, this, this strong, really highly romantic, dramatic music that's very intentional. The big movement though where we see Mahler as the Mahler that we know today is the third movement. It comes from the beginning. We have two movements which have been relatively symphonic, but the opening of the third movement sounds like this.
get, he has a percussion and drummer and bass drums, boom, 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 and play like a boom, shit, boom, shit. Beethoven does this in the Ninth Symphony with the um, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, to mimic the Janissary March, the Turkish March, soldiers. But this isn't meant to mimic that. It's the same sound of a band, but he's trying to mimic a klezmer band, which was a traditional Jewish European band that he grew up, he knew very well growing up in Bohemia, outside the province between Czech, and hearing that sound. So this sound for him was very, very much part of him, part of his fabric. And he puts it into the symphony, but he puts it in a very sardonic way. It's almost satirical. It sounds extremely exaggerated. It's not like he's mocking the band. And it comes in after this funeral march. That's a, a very innocent, that's basically, it's, he used a child nursery march after a funeral march. And then after that is followed that blissful sense of nature with muted strings and harp, which also in celestial music. This is all within one movement. That's the Mahler we know and love. I wrote about that in the notes, the section that I talk where he said, the third movement is when we really hear the character of Mahler we recognize today. Ironic, mad music displaying damaged innocence and shifting from the sublime to the ridiculous, sometimes without warning. Even at a young man, we still hear that. It's not the part yet without warning. In his later symphonies, you hear music that goes from this sound, but it just feel like it was shattered, like a bomb went off, and it goes to completely another sound. It's conflicting. It's du that's the dualism. It's full of so many layers, and he's because he felt so conflicted about so many things that there cannot be goodness without bad, and there cannot be utopia without dystopia, and all these ideas that conflicted that he saw a lot of didn't carry a lot of weight for him. Um, it goes into the final movement, returns the opening the material, like a classic symphony does bring back moments, and it has a double, you know, double exposition to the end, and ends in D major triumphantly. But I want to talk about that before, what that might mean, and why he uses these songs and these elements in there that come back, because he, most like most German composers, they write symphonies. They write, I mean, they write, um, songs before symphonies, a lot of them were song composers. And he had a, quite a book, big book of songs, but at start, early on he started conducting a lot of operas and a lot of vocal music, and like I said, being opera conductors, I mean, here's a short list, a short list of his, um, his gigs as a young man, and this is like late 20s, a Disney movie couldn't romanticize a better script than this. He had so much success, more, James Levine, Gustavo Dudamel combined, he put them to shame. In his late 20s, Leipzig Opera, 1886, he's 26 years old. Neue Deutsches Theater, assistant conductor. Neue Stadt Theater in Leipzig, 1886. The Royal Hungarian Opera, Budapest, 1888, two years later, he's 28 years old. Vienna Court Opera, the Hof Hofkort, this was the big one. This one, he was there for 10 years and really set himself as an opera composer, did all the standard operas. Um, that was the post where he converted to Judaism because they wouldn't hire a Jew, a convert to Christian, Christianity. 10 years, 1907, then Vienna Philharmonic, still today one of probably the greatest orchestra of all time. Metropolitan Opera right in, right in New York, and then New York Philharmonic, the last two years of his life, 1909 to 1911. He was known as an opera conductor. He had these credentials, but he didn't write one opera. This man, as coming from where he's coming from, this, this piece, the first symphony began as a tone poem, and then a tone poem in five movements, and then finally he shortened it to Titan, a tone poem in the form of a symphony. And then he took away, Titan stuck, I don't think he would have liked that. I don't or the Symphony of a Thousand in the first eight symphony. He didn't like that he would have took, taken it away. He took that away completely and left it to four movements. If we look at a standard symphony form, let me just run four movements. One, two, three, four, which the four to, which the first symphony does honor. This is usually a slow movement or a scherzo. This is three is used scherzo. And four and one kind of relate. They both are in sonata form. Or it could be in some kind of variation form, the last movement sonata. And they both use material to round off the symphony, make a rounded arc form to bring the material back. But he insisted on even the first one after this temperamental when a symphony finally reached its final form in 1896, 10 years after it was written. It went through songs, it went through those songs of the Wayfair songs were in there. Then the second symphony has text, the resurrection. He kept it a symphony, but always, always feeling temperamental about it. The eighth symphony is a piece that uses Latin text. From the Latin Requiem Mass, the many creators, many creators, Spiritus, the Lord rise up. It's very another very Christian image, and it's in two parts. And then the second part is uses um, Goethe's Faust text about when he comes up after being damned from hell to rise up again. Another resurrection he uses Latin text. It's in two parts, like the box of St. Matthew's Passion, like it's an oratorio, but yet he labels it a symphony. And even after that, the song cycle, Das Lied von der Erde, the Song of the Earth is a song cycle for two voices and orchestra. 
It goes through the text, he writes a song about at the top, he wrote a symphony for voice and chorus. Even in the early stages of this work, the first symphony, he kept marking it as a symphony. Even when it wasn't even written, he, oh, in most of his letters, that's why we, before the tone poem, we still called it a symphony, because he always called it a symphony. Why did the name, the word symphony, always find itself in the title of his works? Symphony A, part one, part two. Doesn't match. It does not equal. Song cycle, song of the earth. Das Lied von der Erde. There, I'm going to mix both languages. It's in a, in a form of one, two, three, it's got multiple movements that has that progressive tonality from D major to D flat. But it doesn't equal. The form doesn't really look. It's just a symphony. Because Mahler, like I said earlier, was a sound engineer. Because Mahler, like I said earlier, the symphony is like the world. It must contain everything. Because Mahler saw how much potential was in the genre of the symphony. He would hear this, the modern sound, these worlds, he didn't need other genres. And I was saying earlier, like, I know we're moving out. We could, I can stay here talking, you don't have to go to the concert, but I'll make sure <laughs> that the He created that the genre of the symphony, what that meant to him. And even at the time, opera was huge. After, even after Beethoven's Nine, the Denver composers were dedicating their lives to symphonies. Opera was still huge. It was a main form of entertainment. It's like the movies nowadays. They would go to just see a show, you know? And he was, in, he was prime in it. He was the number one opera guy. He was, but he did not write an opera. It was not because of intimidation. It was not to write, write a concerto. It's because the whole world, his whole world, he could put in a symphony. All those genres, even though he's in one space, Finn, one of the greatest composers who ever lived, and he's up there with the ranks of Tchaikovsky and Beethoven, and all those guys that wrote operas, symphonies, concertos. But he's up there and he has just a group of 10 symphonies, 10 and a half, because Dusty von Erdo is not numbered. It's because he put all those genres in there. The cantata form is in the eight symphonies you saw. The two part, the oratory, opera, cantata, concerto, solo instruments are all within the symphony. And from a young man, he does. He comes right off the bat with his first symphony. He comes with that style. We hear the modern concern of creating a sonic landscape in the structural concerns of a symphony. I'm going to say that one more time. We hear the modern concern of creating landscapes, so that's creating sound space like he did in the beginning. You hear all those open strings, open patterns, in the structural concerns of a symphony. Wagner had that modern concern, but he put it in an opera. You know, and then list with the Faust symphony, he made a story, but the story about it. Ma doesn't need a story. Ma didn't need a stage. With didn't need a, of characters, he didn't need to put an opera stage, he, all he needed was a symphony orchestra. That's why he saw those, those musical techniques that could just be done strictly musically. The, um, like that quote I read earlier. Composing a symphony means to me building a new world with every available technical needs. The ever new and changing content determines its own. Every available technical needs. So that's why, so this is so important, I think kind of, because when you go out there to listen to the symphony, it's a different approach. In the beginning, I mentioned this at the beginning of the program notes. When you listen to Mahler, different way, dare I say, I know we're not supposed to do that. I can't, wait, can't pretend Mahler, I can't pretend like I know, but I'm going to break their rule right now. I'm using the story. <laughs> that, you have, that he comes from, it is a different approach to the symphony than anyone before him because he only wrote symphonies. And when even he had the opportunity, the number one opera guy, you can make a lot of money writing an opera, conducting as he did, all the skills he had, his eighth symphony with the Latin text that's used in every mass. Masses, oratorios, it's a solo symphony. It's a symphony as the world. It's beyond religion. He's not putting it, but it's the structure of the symphony because that grows. The symphony is ever-changing in its own development. Thank you all. Enjoy them all along.